I'm going to introduce our speaker here tonight. And, uh, you know, I think most of you know Dr. Salka, uh, very well written, uh, published uh, doc. And uh, he's uh, worked at Nova, uh, the optometry school, uh, for about 28 and a half years. And this year he's relocated to uh, the Sarasota Area Center uh, for sight. Um, Joe is a very gifted writer. He serves uh, at the academy uh, for the, uh, as uh, uh, for retina and on the in, in the neuro, neuro arena, which perfectly fits for tonight's topic. That Doctor I C Double, uh, but I think as Joe is as much as a gifted writer, he's as much as a gifted educator and presenter. So, everyone out there, do that virtual round of applause and Joe, welcome and. Uh, Dr. IC Double, Managing Cranial Nerve Palsy. Dr. Salka, it's all yours. Very good. All right, we're gonna go start with our, our talk tonight and here's our education. Now, there, uh, I'm on a number of speakers bureaus and advisory boards, including the Bardis, Allergan, Oculotherapeutics, Glacos, Bausch, Zeiss, and Aerie, but I've got no financial interest in any product uh, that we may talk about. We're really talking about no products. I am a co I am a co owner with uh, with Greg uh, of Optometric Education Consultants. Now we're going to talk about a few things. Um, you know, ocular motility problems. We got the non paralytic strabismus. We got the paralytic strabismus. That's three, four, uh, and six nerve palsies. We've got the muscle restrictions. We have that's thyroid disease. We have neuromuscular junction disease. That's myasthenia gravis. I'm going to really, in this uh, 50 minutes, really focus on, on the paralytic strabismus. And there are a number of questions we have to ask uh, about patients who come in saying, Doctor, I, I see double. You know, is it is it indeed real? Uh, is it uh, is it present in one eye or both eyes? Is it side by side or up and down? Does it get worse looking right or left? And is it greater at distance or near? So these are all things we have to, we have to ask and answer. And the first one is probably the, the, the most important. When, when patients come in and complaining of double vision, the first thing that I recommend trying to do is just talk them out of it. You know, it's not really double, is it? Uh, you know, your, your bifocals look, look tilted, uh, your glasses a little bit off. But if I can't talk them out of it, you know, then we have to really start uh, digging in and try figuring this out. Is it one eye or both eyes? There are a number of non-neurogenic etiologies. Keratoconus, astigmatism, uncorrected refractive error where the ghosting of images uh, is, is something that patients will, will see. And there's a number of other things. Uh, simple, just, you know, put up a pinhole. You know, that will cure the monocular diplopia, and that tells you you've got something that's not neurogenic. Cataract, I'm going to talk about that for just a second. Double vision, monocular double vision happens probably more in cataract than we realize. Patients are complaining about the decreased color perception, they're complaining about the decreased acuity, but diplopia is there. I had a cataract, I had, I had dense, milky NS cataract. I had a, I, you know, my first cataract, I, I had a five, di, pretty rapid five diopter shift in my refractive error. And I saw double in, in, in my cataract eye. In fact, I saw triple. You know, I had triplope. If I were to look at something on the, uh, on my dashboard, my D for drive, I'd see it. And then be one to the side of it, one above it. So I actually saw triple. But monocular double, double vision is not an emergency. It's not neurologic. Is it side by side or up and down? Okay, side by side it is possibly one of you know one of, one of four muscles. You know those are the medial recti or lateral recti, and I can tell you right now we don't get medial recti palsies. Vertical can be you know one of potentially eight muscles: uh, inferior rectus, superior oblique, uh, inferior oblique, superior recti. These are all things that are possible. Does it get worse in a, in a particular direction of gaze? Horizontal double vision worse to the right is two potential muscles. 
the right lateral rectus or right or left medial rectus. And medial recti pulses really don't happen. Horizontal worse to the left is going to be a superior oblique or inferior oblique on the right side, superior rectus or inferior rectus on the left side. And you can see here that if we can isolate the muscle, we know what nerve is going to be. Is it worse at distance or near? Horizontal worse at near is, is a medial recti problem. Horizontal double vision worse at distance is going to be a lateral recti problem. And vertical double vision worse at near is going to be a superior oblique problem. So by asking and answering these questions, we know what nerve is involved. Once we know or what muscle is involved. Once we know what muscle is involved, we know what nerve is involved. So is it real? And what was the onset? You know, things that happen acutely, um, you know, can involve a number of things, including aneurysm, but most likely can be vasculopathic. And that's one of the most common causes of a cranial neuropathy. And they're going to last about three months. And anything that goes over three months is going to be probably something else. And the vast majority of these things will resolve on their own within three months. Now, what is a course? Is it getting better or worse? Something that progressively increased for a few days stabilized and now is progressively getting better, probably points to an ischemic uh, event. Something that's getting progressively worse is going to uh, point to more likely a compressive event. And something that is variable is probably going to be neuromuscular junctional. Is there anything else new? We, you know, we, we can't ask every question possible but I like to encourage patients to tell me what else has happened. What happened before you had the double vision? What happened subsequent to the double vision? There's this concept that I've come up with called spatial temporality. Things that happen in time and space, we can't ignore those. And if you ask the patient, they will usually remember and share with you what else happened about the same time they started having double vision. And is it a cranial neuropathy alone, or are there other travelers on this journey? What does the pupil look like? What does the lid look like? Is there a paresthesia? Is there a hemiparesis? Is there a weakness? You know, what else has happened with it? So we're going to start off by asking, which is better, one or two? Two people with ostensibly the same diagnosis, but different prognoses. Better one, <clears throat> better two. First person, a 63-year-old Indian male who was a long-standing glaucoma patient of mine, he developed a sudden onset of orbital pain, right? and that was his complaint, pain, of about three days duration. It began somewhat modestly on a Friday, and he, t he tried to ignore it. it, got worse on a Saturday, was excruciating on Sunday, and comes to see me on Monday because yeah, I'm, I'm his eye doctor and he walks in for an emergency glaucoma evaluation. Now he's diabetic and hypertensive. He's on Coumadin with a pacemaker and this is actually kind of important part of the story. He has no vision change and he looks like this. And we can see he's getting, this is all a, a new presentation for him. He's got a partial ptosis, not complete. And what we can see of the eye, we can see it's probably a little bit exotropic and probably a little bit of hypotropic. Now when we lift his lid, he cannot look up, he cannot look down, he cannot adduct his eye, but he can AB or abduct his eye. And this involves inferior rectus, superior rectus, uh, medial rectus, inferior oblique. The only thing that I didn't, we didn't test uh, for a torsion for, in cranial nerve four, but cranial nerve six is intact. And this really leaves us with a classic picture of a third nerve palsy. So when dealing with third nerve palsy, the next question we have to ask is, what does the pupil look like? And the pupil looks like a small two millimeter briskly reactive pupil on the left side, a five millimeter unresponsive to light near or accommodation in the, in the right eye. And this is all pointing toward compression. And more likely than not, when we deal with this situation, we have to consider first and foremost, this is an aneurysm within subarachnoid space compressing the third nerve. And the most likely vessel is the posterior communicating artery. 
Now, what are we dealing with here? We have a pupil involved third nerve palsy, or one I might want to say that it is a partial third nerve palsy, or nearly complete, of three days duration at least. And this is also a very important part of the story. And this is most likely going to be an intracranial aneurysm, particularly a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. The exam was not long. You know, the, the, the exam was, was all of 10, you know, 10 minutes. And most of that was explaining what was going on. And we had a, we had a long, long conversation, I had, had a conversation with the patient and his wife explaining what was going on. The fact that he needed to go to an emergency room. I, I offered to call an ambulance. And a patient where you think there's an intracranial aneurysm, an ambulance is not inappropriate. First and foremost, the person who comes in on a gurney gets treated differently than the person who walks in on their own power. Also, if there's a rupture of the aneurysm, we need the patient to be in a situation where they can be stabilized and transported. They both declined, but his wife said she would drive him to the emergency room uh, immediately. So I gave, you know, I gave them a note that said patient has a right pupil involved, third nerve palsy, suspects intracranial aneurysm, the posterior communicating artery, patient needs neurosurgical consult stat. And as I was writing this down and talking with him, I, I detected his wife was getting quite anxious. I knew she was about to ask me the question that I knew was coming. And the question that I knew was coming was, how much is this all going to cost? We don't have insurance. And my response was, it doesn't matter. He's going to die. You don't walk this off. It doesn't get better. If you take him home, he lays down. He is eventually going to become comatose and die, and it will be too late. They took this to heart. 45 minutes after they left my office, I got a call on my cell phone. He was already in a CT scanner. Now, why is he in a CT scanner? It's actually probably the better imaging, non-invasively for third nerve palsy, and he's got a pacemaker. He can't have an MRI. Also, he's on Coumadin. When, if he starts to bleed or, or when he starts to bleed and leak, he's not gonna stop bleeding. So these are all very bad things. He was hospitalized for 23 days, which tells you how sick these people are. He was hospitalized for 23 days. He underwent endovascular packing of that aneurysm with the inner coils, preventing the aneurysm from bursting, and it saved his life. And this is sort of what he this is sort of what he looks like uh, he looks like today. You know, on the on the left side of your screen, his ptosis is almost completely resolved, but his motility did not change. He cannot adduct his eye, cannot elevate his eye, cannot depress his eye, and his pupil is fixed and dilated. Now, if he walked into your office and didn't tell you any of his history, most people would right, rightfully react to it, or, or as I would say, panic, because it's a third nerve palsy but he has been treated as well as he can be treated to prevent aneurysm rupture. And you can see he actually has what is called pseudo von Grafe's sign. When he looks down, his eyelid stays up. This is from secondary aberrant regeneration, which is expected after this event. After trauma, tumor, and aneurysm, there is a regeneration of the, of the fibers of the third nerve but it's aberrant. So fibers that go to the medial rectus also go to the levator, and fibers that go to the inferior rectus also go to the levator. So when he tries to AD duct, his eyelid's gonna come up a little bit. When he AB ducts, his eyelid's gonna come down a little bit, and when he looks down, inferior rectus and levator are both working, and his eyelid stays up. That's, that is a secondary aberrant regeneration which never happens after ischemic infarct. Diabetes, hypertension will never cause this. If this occurs in a presumptive ischemic vascular palsy, something else has been missed. A more thorough evaluation needs to be undertaken. So third nerve palsy is either down and out with a ptosis, there's adduction, elevation, depression, deficits, and the patient may, may be isochoric or anisochoric. Now, here's a patient that had been seen at our university clinic in the general care clinic before I had left. And this is actually a follow-up. And he is an, obviously an elderly man with a heck of a lot of dermatoshelasis. 
mean, it's almost hard to to ferret out the uh, to ferret out the 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 ptosis here. Now he's also poorly controlled diabetic. His 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 sugars were in the 300 level at least. And I think his hemoglobin was around 11. Now when he first came in, he actually had reportedly a partial third nerve palsy. And he was neuroimaged, but I think he was neuroimaged through the primary care physician. And I think the, the attendings and the residents who are working on this case probably called the, uh, the primary care physician. And I think overwhelmed the person with information talking about uh, aneurysms and needs MRI. And I think the internist got a little bit overwhelmed and somebody along the lines probably said, but the patient's badly diabetic and it's probably ischemic. And that was the word that the internist heard. So when I got involved or invited to see his patient in follow-up, he now has a complete third nerve palsy. Pupils are symmetrical and reactive. There's no dilation or sluggishness. But I looked at the MRI report and it said indication for imaging brain ischemia. Now, if you're looking for an aneurysm, you need to tell the radiologist this. I can tell you right now, the, the best neuroradiologist in the world can't help you if you don't order the scan, order the right scan, and tell them what you're looking for. Brain ischemia is not going to find an aneurysm unless they're looking for it. Also, the patient had an MRI. Now, we are looking for an A aneurysm. In order to find an A, you need an A, and there's no A in MRI. This is the person, if we're looking for an aneurysm, we need to look for or use either a CT or an MRA, MRA or CTA, to find this. And this is the area right, right here in subarachnoid space. Things that are happening in the brain stem in the cortical spinal tract or the red nucleus will give hemiparesis, uh, ataxic gait. They're complicated. It's this area here where the vessel and the nerve run in parallel. Greg, I think it's time for polling question number one, if you can pull that up for me. I was ready for you there, Doc. So, All right. So which is okay. not an emergency? A pupil involved third nerve palsy, people spared partial third nerve palsy, isolated, dilated people with normal eyelid and normal motility. None are emergencies and they're all emergencies. And Joe, as they're weighing in there, I'd like to remind everyone <clears throat> that I did launch the handout. Um, it's in the chat area. It looks like it could be downloaded. It looks like it's about one megabyte in size. And, and you can also type questions there and I'll monitor them. There are no questions there, Joe. And I wanted okay. to remind everyone about the, the handout being there. Okay, well, we're getting pretty close. And what we see here is the vast majority said that they are all, well, not vast, the, the slight majority, I, I hate to say what, what this, I hate to say what this reminds me of, so I'm not going to, of current events with changing numbers. But uh, it says they're all emergencies edging out by one percentage point in the state of Georgia. I'm sorry, that was not allowed. Isolated, dilated people with normal eyelid and normal motility. That is actually not an emergency. An isolated, dilated pupil is virtually never an aneurysm. But anything else is pretty darn serious. All right, so do we share the results, Greg? Yeah, if you can, uh, yeah, share them. Go right ahead. So the isolated, dilated pupil with normal eyelid and normal tilly really is not going to be an emergency. It looks like we had a tie as they are emergencies, but pupil involved a Pupil spared partial, I, I would agree, are, okay? They are emergencies. Okay. Well, the pupil and motor fibers are coating the third nerve. And as such, they're vulnerable to compression. But I can tell you now, you're not going to have compression from the outside, only giving you a pupil involvement, or dilated pupil. You'll have lid dysfunction you'll have motility dysfunction. 
Now, in ischemic vascular palsy, such as with diabetes, there's an infarct in the base of his arm, which will actually knock out the third nerve, but because of a rich anastomotic bloodshed communication around, those pupil and motor fibers are going to be pretty well uh, nourished, and the pupil's going to be normal. Now, early in the case, sometimes the pupil may not be involved as an aneurysm is expanding. It's not common, but it has been known to happen. Now, pa individual patient anatomy is also very important. In some patients where the vessel and the nerve are actually fairly far apart, you need a big aneurysm in order to cause compression. Conversely, if the vessel and the nerve are actually very close to one another, a small aneurysm can cause compression, yet may not be picked up on, neuro on neuroimaging. A dilated, poorly reactive pupil means compression. We, all, we, we have to have that on the table. Now, pain can be anything. Painful is only, pain is only helpful if it's not there. Aneurysms are always painful. They're touching pain-sensitive uh, dural meninges. They're going to be bleeding, and the, the blood is going to irritate the meninges. They're always painful. Ischemic vascular palsy are painful about 90% of the time. So if there's no pain, that's actually helpful. If it's pain, we can't qualify the pain and say, well, aneurysms are going to cause a boring, debilitating, thunderclap, hemicranial pain. That's not really true. Case in point, Temple University football player develops a third nerve palsy with a little bit of headache, aneurysm. Little old lady, worst head pain of her life, diabetes. Pain is only helpful if it's not there. And a spared pupil does not always rule out aneurysm, particularly in the partial palsies, because these are developing, and aneurysm will, ex will, will expand. And, at, and as it expands, it can lead to pupil involvement a little bit later. And this is a nice example right here. We see a patient with, with a partial palsy, right? Can't look up all the way, but can look up a little bit. There's a, par there's a partial ptosis here. We have to consider when these partial palsies come in that they are expanding aneurysms that are just developing. Now, if the pupil is involved, and it's, it, it, there's no question, we have an aneurysm. Now, a third of third nerve palsies are caused by aneurysm. I'm going to qualify this. I want you to walk away thinking that every time you see a patient with a third nerve palsy, there's a 30% chance that it's caused by an aneurysm. Is that really what I'm saying? If we look at large series reports of, of this condition, they have to come from somewhere and about a third are aneurysmal. But I don't want you to think this means everybody. You can have a patient that, as we look at the patient, the clinical findings, we can realize there's probably a 90% chance that this patient has an aneurysm, but based upon other characteristics, there's maybe a 5% chance that this one has, has an aneurysm. Vasculopathic third nerves will resolve over time, but artery uh, aneurysms will rupture in time, and they're, they're, they're life-threatening. The reason that I'm putting such emphasis on this if a third nerve palsy is caused by an aneurysm, 20% will die within 48 hours from rupture of the aneurysm. It's pretty, pretty sobering. 20% will die within 48 hours. 50% overall will die. There's a 50% mortality. <clears throat> the average time to onset from onset to rupture is within a month. You know, they'll, the majority will rupture with it, with it within a month, and many patients will actually never make it to the hospital. Now, there are ways to treat this. There are two ways to approach this. One is with endovascular therapy, where they go through the femoral artery with a catheter. They'll put a stent in here to hold the vessel open, and they'll squeeze and pack this aneurysm with coils. And that will prevent blood from getting in there. If blood doesn't get in there, it's not going to rupture most of the time. Now, the other option is with intracranial surgery, where they actually put an aneurysm clip, like a clip on a bag of potato chips, and clip it off. Now, both are actually relatively easy procedures and straightforward procedures for a skilled neurosurgeon. Both are, are equally effective. They have said there has been reported that aneurysm clips have a better return to function 
than, uh, than the coils. But both are, are very straightforward, very simple for a skilled neurosurgeon. The only, the only difference here is this actually requires a craniotomy. Now, imaging. I think we all agree that most every patient who has a third nerve palsy will get some sort of imaging. And if there is a high suspicion of, of aneurysm, they'll undergo digital subtraction, arteriography, or angiography, and that'll be done in the hospital under, under, under the direction of a neurosurgeon. CT and CT angiography is the preferred non-invasive imaging for third nerve palsy. CT angiography will will demonstrate the vascular system very well and show the aneurysm very well. And CT is great for subarachnoid hemorrhage to see if there's any bleeding. Now, it does require contrast and they're really impaired. MRI or MRA are probably going to be preferable. But if they can't have an MRI or MRA because they, they have a pacemaker claustrophobic, then CTA is, is going to be superior. And if you're wrong, or wrong, and it's not an aneurysm, but something like a sarcoid granule or, or a, a neoplasm, MRI is superior to finding those things. And the MRA adds very little time to a scan. So most patients are going to get a CT, CTA, MR, MR, MRA. But the most important thing is if you're looking for an aneurysm, which begins with an A, you have to have an a in whatever you're looking for. So you need a CTA or an MRA. An MRI is not sufficient. A CT is not sufficient because there is no A in MRI. And they're really quite good at identifying where, where, the, where the lesion is. My recommendation, if you order this on your own, you know, spend the extra money and get the ones that actually come with the uh, with the arrows telling you where to look because they're much easier to interpret. Now here's a different patient with a different prognosis. She's a 63 year old female. She's diabetic and hypertensive, not well controlled on either of them. And she comes in complaining of a sudden onset retroorbital pain. Now here's the interesting thing about this. She's not complaining that she can't open her eyelid. She's not complaining that she sees double if she lifts up her eyelid. She's complaining about the pain. So when we lift up the eyelid, she cannot look up. She cannot look down. She can AD duck the eye. The eye in primary gaze is down and out, and, but she can AD duck the eye. So here's a woman with a complete third nerve palsy. Pupils are, are symmetrical and reactive, not dilated. She's got vascular vasculopathic risk factors, she's older. So it leads me back to my question, which is better, one or two? Better one, better two, better one, better two. Can I say it again? She resolved over several weeks without complication. He was hospitalized 23 days, the two neurosurgical procedures, but he did live. I always suspect the worst. I was actually doing this live somewhere out west either Montana or Wyoming, I don't recall where. And in the audience, when the an optometrist actually shared a case, you know, during our discussion of a patient that they saw with a third nerve palsy in their practice, and they're kind of in a rural sort of area. And I don't recall what the pup pupil involvement was. I, I don't think he, he, he told us. But they referred the patient to an ophthalmologist the next day. That was the plan. Unfortunately, it was aneurysm. Patient had subarachnoid hemorrhage and, and, and died, died that night before he even made it in. Now, does the presence of vasculopathic risk factors help in my determination? Well, these risk factors for arteriosclerosis in an old person does favor a microvascular etiology, but doesn't rule out an aneurysm. Because hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, they're all very common. They don't protect against aneurysm. So the answer is no, but it makes me very nervous when they're not there. Does the acuteness of the presentation help? Honey, yes, kind of no. Aneurysm expansion usually is pretty acute, but chronic and evolving cases are reported. So acute is worrisome. Chronic and improvement is less worrisome, but it doesn't rule out an aneurysm. What I like best, resolved without recurrence. That's the best. So what is our threat assessment for an aneurysm of an isolated third nerve palsy? 
an isolated dilated pupil is not an emergency. It's a pharmacologic misadventure. It's a ganglionic lesion. It's, it's a tonic pupil. It is, it is trauma. It is not an aneurysm. A complete third nerve palsy with a normal pupil in an older person, vascopathic risk factors, a low risk of aneurysm. A partial third, regardless of the pupil, is a high risk. And a pupil involved third is our emergency, one of the true emergencies that we see in eye care. And I just talked how isolated, dilated pupils are really virtually never an aneurysm. You're never out of the woods. Patient had a third nerve palsy from an aneurysm. Now, of course, we talked about the, the treatment of, of clip or, or coils. Now, the thing about the coils is they're all inert, but there was a time that all aneurysm clips were not MRI approved. Patient was treated with an aneurysm clip and the radiologic tech didn't verify what type of clip and it was not approved for MRI use. And the patient underwent an MRI in a major medical center, I think in Texas, with a non-MRI safe aneurysm clip in place. It displaced during the MRI, the patient had a fatal hemorrhage and died during the procedure. So essentially, he survived the disease but was killed by the follow-up. Greg, brings me a polling question number two. Going to launch it right now. I believe the new upgrade, Joe, allows you to see the question. Is that correct? It does. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and take it and run with it. Which of the following does not get sent to an emergency department? Isolated, dilated pupil, pupil involved third nerve palsy, or pupil spared third nerve palsy? Which one does not get sent to the ER? And there was a question that rolled in, at least okay. on a desktop version. It has nothing to do with uh, um, with the presentation right now, Joe. It's about the, the handout. Someone rolled in and just said, where's the handout? To me, on the desktop version, if you go to the chat area, it's at the top. It'll, you'll see it as a PDF downloadable. It says Dr. I see double handout. So, so I think we're going we're to end the polling. And we're going to share the results. And the vast majority, isolated, dilated pupil does does not get sent to an emergency room. That's something pretty, pretty simple. Pupil involved third, absolutely. Pupil spared, partial third, definitely as well, because that's probably an ensuing aneurysm. So very good, guys. Hey, that's Jen, I got a question for you yeah. before you get started. There seems to be a lot of information here. Do you have a really easy way to kind of sum this all up? Well, Greg, it's, it's remarkable you should say that. Because to sum it up, I have my O to a third. When the eye is down and out with ptosis, you better hope for meiosis. If the palsy is total with pupil sparing and oldie, it's vascular, not too daring. A partial palsy calls for double duty because it's probably an aneurysm going through puberty. But if the pupil is dilated and aneurysm is violated, no time for deferral, no time for referral. Send to the ER without debate. Remember, 20% will die within the first 48. And if you can remember that, that's all you need. So, Joe, there's times whenever, you know, I use, yes, phone a friend being with your, you know, um, expertise in this neuro arena. You know, someone comes in down and out. You know, what would be the question that you're going to ask me? Just to, I know you have it summarized here well on this ode. But, you know, hey, Joe, I got this third nerve palsy. The, the eye's down and out. Joe, I know it's third. What, what's going to be the next question you're going to ask me that you want to know? What does the pupil look like? Okay. And then uh, pupils uh, involved. Pupils involved? Well, we know what to do. And that goes right to the ER. Okay. So pupils not involved. Uh, now what? Pain. These are pain. Okay. And then help me out when, when there's, uh, okay, there's, there, there's no pain involved. No pain involved. How old is the patient? Um, I don't know. Let's put them in their like 50s. 50s? Do they have ischemic vascular diseases, diabetes, or hypertension? Um, no. Well, they don't, if they don't have, they don't have ischemic vascular diseases, even though people, it, it, you know, is it a complete policy? Um, let's say partial? yes. Let's just say yes. Okay. 
if there's no if there's no ischemic va if there's no ischemic vascular diseases, I'm very nervous about it. Okay. And I'm probably going to get the imaging probably that day or the next day at the latest. Perfect. Yep. So. Just kind of want to go through that process. You did a great job there. I just thought I'd give it like a real live, you know, phone a friend type of situation. So Super I appreciate different. it. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. 35 year old male was referred for his GP for, for a vertical double vision for two days. Everything coming in is pretty well unremarkable, but he's got a right hyper deviation worse on left gaze and right head tilt. Medical history is normal, but he had the worst case of sinusitis he's ever had. It began a week before his double vision. What does he have? He's got clearly a right fourth nerve palsy. So I asked him the questions is, which eye is higher in primary gaze? Does the hyper get worse on right or left gaze? And does it get worse on right or left head tilt? Now, keep in mind, not all fourth nerve palsies will obey every, every one of these three steps, the parts three step. But it's Classically, hyperdeviation in primary gaze, which is greater in opposite gaze and ipsilateral head tilt. If you can say that as you're doing the alternate cover test, like this, like this, like this, and like this, you're good. That's what it is. This is such a common cause that vertical diplopia should be considered a fourth nerve pulse, palsy until proven otherwise. Now, if it doesn't match out to a fourth nerve palsy, it's probably a skew deviation involving midbrain disease or otolith disease. And how do you tell? Lay the patient back and check the motility again. A skew deviation will actually improve when they're supine. A fourth nerve palsy will not. And a skew is just a, a very unusual vertical imbalance that is not a fourth nerve palsy. Very common in kids. Very, very easy in trauma, congenital. You know, we, 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 we can see this in the kids. Now this young woman, she has a clear right hyper. She's 17 years old. She was involved in an automobile accident. When I mean by automobile accident, I'm talking very, very mild. About the same impact as bumper cars, if you, if you remember bumper cars. Both cars drove away, no problems. Next morning, she had vertical double vision. Fourth nerve is very prone to trauma and it doesn't take a lot of trauma to cause a fourth. It doesn't have to be direct head trauma or eye trauma. And this young young girl here, we have what I call a, dub, a double fourth. She has a left fourth and Dolly has a right fourth. So this is exiting the midbrain posteriorly and decussates around the anterior medullary vellum. And it's got the longest, most exposed course because, and, and that makes it very prone to trauma. Now third and six, you need a lot of trauma to have for that to happen. Fourth, you don't. And a lot of time, these times, these will actually decompensate. They've been longstanding. You look and the patient has a compensatory head tilt. When I see that walk into an exam room, I know there's a fourth nerve palsy. Always remember my, my, the rule of 40, 30, 20, 10. 40% 40 are traumatic, 30% are idiopathic, 20% are ischemic vascular, and 10% are something very sinister, such as a CNS lesion. Now, in my entire career, I probably have neuroimaged one fourth nerve palsy. It was in my new practice, a fellow, uh, older fellow had come in and he had about a two month history of vertical double vision, classic fourth nerve palsy, but his history was he was on maintenance chemotherapy for, for lung cancer. And he said, doc, my, my gripper isn't what it used to be, okay? Hemiparesis, fourth nerve palsy, cancer diagnosis. So I'm on a Thursday, by, time, by Monday, he, he, they were all involving hospice. He had brain metastasis. But that is not the rule, that is the exception. So for isolated, non-traumatic, six, you know, fourth nerve palsies, look for ischemic vascular disease, but understand non-ischemic causes of non-traumatic, isolated force are pretty rare. 
and look for for signs of long-standing decompensation. They, you know, they they've been trying to put their eyes together for so long. You know, it's it's like it's like you're lifting, you know, you're you're lifting a dumbbell repeatedly. Right? You're going to build a bigger bicep. Vertical vergences are are pretty impressive. And look at old photos and look for that compensatory head tilt. Now, going back to our 35-year-old mayor, what are the possible etiologies of a young person like this for the fourth? New onset, myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis, ischemic disease, infectious disease, inflammatory disease, but spatial temporality. The worst sinus infection of his life about a week before he started seeing double. Those bony sinuses are very thin. He had erosion of inflammation from a sinus outcome. When a sinus infection was treated properly and resolved, his double vision went away. Following question number three, Greg. It is launched. What is the most common cause of fourth third palsy? Is it trauma, tumor, congenital, or idiopathic? Most common, 40, 30, 20, 10. 40% are, I think we're just about there with our electorate. All right, I'm going to end the polling. I'm going to share the results, and the vast majority said it correctly. Trauma, congenital, and idiopathic are also very, uh, very, very common. That's a lot of stuff to remember. So if you can't remember, I have my O to vertical double vision. We... I'll take care of that for you. I'll just do I a guess. slide it out. I think I'm going to leave them up for a little bit, Joe, the, the sharing of the polls. And, okay. then, uh, and then I'll relaunch it. All you have to do is slide it out of the way. Okay. Well, when your patient sees double up and down, it's rarely a cause to frown. Look for a tilt and prove it's old. Remember, vertical vergences will be bold. It's a fourth until proven otherwise. Trauma congenital apathic, you should surmise. But if it's not a fourth and it's new, lay him back because it's probably askew. And if you can remember that, you're going to stay out of trouble. And that brings me to a 37-year-old white male who has a sudden onset painful double vision, horizontal of six days duration, worse at distance and in right gaze. Now, medical history, he reports as being normal. He went to an ER the night before. They did a CBC and a non-contrast enhanced CT scan because that's what they do, which he told me were reportedly normal. He's a pack-a-day smoker, recovering alcoholic. He has a good acuity in each eye. He has a right abduction deficit. Pupils are normal. Forced duction testing was normal or negative. And his blood pressure was elevated in office at 144 over 102. So diagnosis at this point was a right presumptive vasogenic six nerve palsy, isolated, secondary to his undiagnosed hypertension. Didn't do any more imaging at that point. I recommended that he patch his eye during a diplopic period. Referred him to a primary care physician for general physical. He was diagnosed then with hypertension and treated. And within about 12 weeks, his double vision resolved. So the hallmark sign is horizontal double vision, greater distance with an abduction deficit. Now, very important, don't get face to face with these patients and, and look at their motilities. Have them look at your chart on the wall and do the alternate cover test, primary gaze, right gaze, left gaze. And we have an, we have an abduction deficit, worse at distance, okay? and it's going to be horizontal. And I always make sure we're checking at distance, and I always like to do the force duction test, put a little bit of preparacane in the eye. Can I move that eye easily out? And if I can, we know it's not bony entrapment or thyroid disease or muscle infiltration. It's neurologic. If I can't move it, I've got to think of something mechanical restricting. Now, with mass lesions and increased intracranial pressure, 
the brain stem is going to herniate down through frame and magma. The sixth nerve is going to get stretched across the, the clivus. So sixth nerve palsy is pretty common in patients who have increased intracranial pressure from brain tumor and pseudotumor. So six nerve, unilateral six nerve, bilateral disc edema is telling you there's increased intracranial pressure here. Now managing six nerve palsies, each case of a six nerve palsy should be classified as being traumatic or non-traumatic. Now non-traumatic cases should be subdivided as being neurologically isolated, just the six nerve, or non-neurologically isolated, there's something else going on, such as disc edema, or Horner syndrome, or hearing loss. These are all things we should look for. And then we have to ascribe it to one of three groups. Is it in a child, in a young adult, or an older adult? Now, breaking these categories down, for me, children is prepubescent. You know, if they're under, if, if, if they're pre, pre puberty, they're considered child. Post puberty, to me, they're a young adult. How far does young adult go? No more than age 50. Now, over age 50, we consider them older adults. Isolated six nerve palsy in older adults usually is not bad. Vascular disease is pretty common, and these will resolve within six months. And I can tell you right now, the vast majority of ischemic palsies are going to be, be significantly better in six weeks. Now, if they're over the age of 60, we always have to consider giants the arteritis. Now, children, it's often bad. Presumptive viral illness accounts for about 50% of these, these six nerve palsies in children. But malignant disease, particularly pontine glioma, has got a very significant rate. And children with six nerve palsies really need to be referred to a pediatric neurologist. Now, in young adults, it's also usually bad because vascular disease and idiopathic, or idiopathic situations are pretty uncommon. But young adults usually don't have an isolated six nerve palsy. They usually have complicated six nerve palsies, like a hemiparesis or a facial paresis or a Horner syndrome. And cerebral vascular accidents, the pons or aneurysms within the cavernous sinus or, or other neoplasms are really pretty common in this group. And it's usually not an isolated sixth. It's usually complicated and it's usually something bad. Now, Here's a clinical pearl. Two places a tumor can hide and cause a six nerve palsy, cavernous sinus, and the base of the pons. Now, a friend and former resident uh, contacted me several weeks ago about somebody who had a, a subtle six nerve paresis. Now, the important part of the history was he had a rare, had just been treated for and recovered from a rare salivary gland cancer. And he was manifesting some double intermittent double vision and I told her to look in the cavern of sinus in the base of the pons. The imaging was done and there, and there was metastatic disease to the uh, cavern of sinus. So the algorithm I like to follow on a six nerve palsy if it's not isolated, if, it, if there's other things neurologically going on, they either need an evaluation or a referral. An isolated six nerve palsy in an older adult can be monitored. An isolated six nerve palsy in a younger adult can be monitored closely or evaluated with neuroimaging or refer that patient. And in a child, they need an evaluation. I think that should be done by a pediatric neurologist. Now, what if we have something that is presumptively, presumptively six nerve, we, is presumptively ischemic vascular, and we're wrong? What have we done to that patient? The answer is we've not really harmed the patient. Even neuro-ophthalmologists can't agree on imaging an isolated six nerve palsy particularly in, a, in an older adult. Half will do it, half will not. 
if you think it's presumptively ischemic and you're wrong, it's not like you're missing an aneurysm that's going to kill a patient. By and large, the patient will not be harmed if the evaluation is done later. So isolated six nerve palsy in, uh, in adults with diabetes, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia. You know, neuroimaging can be deferred unless it gets worse, doesn't improve over three months, or they have other things that develop. Now, ischemic vascular palsies will typically progress over several days. But progress, progression or getting worse over two weeks warrants an evaluation. Greg, that brings me to polling question number four. And I'm sure you can see it, Joe. It has been launched. Isolated six nerve palsy in an adult should always be neuroimaged. I have agree or disagree. These guys are paying attention. Look at those rolling in there. Okay, some agree, the majority disagree. There were about 80, 83% of the electorate. Greg, anytime you want to end that, go right ahead. So, okay, majority we're good. disagree, some agree. As I said, neuroptomologists can't agree on that either. So don't don't worry if you if you if you don't uh, you, you you you're not sure about that one. Neuro ophthalmologists you know often often don't even agree. So that's gonna that, that's gonna I think wrap us up here, Greg, because there was a lot of information there, and I want to leave you with my ode to a sixth. When the double is side by side and abduction does not abide. Prove it's a six with a force duction test. Eliminate muscle, thyroid, and all the rest. In kids and young adult, it's a worry. Get a scan and you better hurry. But in oldie, you're practically free. Prescribe a patch and check, check to see it's better in three. And if you can remember that, that's all you really need for six nerve paresis. Greg, are there any questions that have come in? Not seeing any, any questions rolling in at this point. We'll give it a second here to uh, see if anyone types any questions in. All right, very good. Greg, do you have any questions or anything you want to say to, uh, to uh, clarify things or ask me to clarify or, or bring this one home? Uh, no, I think you did a great job. Uh, you know, obviously I heard you give this a couple times and and every time you give it, Joe, I always learn something new. So, uh, uh, you know, great job and, you know, way to kind of, I hate to say it, simplify uh, cranial nerve palsies, but that's uh, kind of maybe not given enough credit to it, but it really helps uh, really when you see these in the practice. Um, so here are some stuff rolling in. I'm not sure if you have them up, but it says great odes and love the new format. All right. Got a little love on the format. Thank you. Uh, what quick tests do you do in myasthenia gravis? In myasthenia gravis, and it does it doesn't work it does it doesn't work well with the double vision. It work it works good. I mean, it work it work it works well with ptosis, and that's the uh, that's the ice pack test. And good because he had a real quick follow up because there was a thank you Joe, but just real quick it said I E ice pack test grip test etc. So keep going down that road. Yeah, ice ice pack tests. You know, what what happens is the the acetylcholine is blocked, and it it isn't it isn't a, it isn't able to work, and the enzyme acetylcholine breaks it down. Well, by the one thing we can do to stop an enzyme from working is superheat it or supercool it, and by cooling it, the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine is uh, is going to is going to allow the acetylcholine to hang around a little bit longer, and we'll be able to to affect its uh, will be able to affect its uh, its action. So you put an ice pack for about two minutes and see if the ptosis gets better. 
Dumb Vision, it, I, I've had some success. It's not great. And ironically enough, I, I, had, I had taught this to students many years ago. And one of my students went on a rotation to an ophthalmology practice. And they had never heard of this before. And, and she explained it to them. And sometime later, I ran into one of the ophthalmologists. He walks up to me and says, explain the ice pack test to me. And I explained it to him about super cooling the enzyme. He, and he was very impressed. He said, oh, that's, that's very impressive. Okay, you did, did you invent that? And, you know, as much as I wanted to, I, I, I could not lie. I said, yes, yes, I did. <laughs> now, granted, you may not, I don't expect everybody to know that William F. White invented the ice pack test, but I think you should know that I didn't invent it. Anything else there, Greg? No, just a lot of people saying thanks and, you know, great job. Just giving you lots of kudos out there. 